Let's do it. We're going. What's up, everyone? What's up, everyone? Chris Lopez here, and welcome to our live Q and A on the tribe of multifamily mentors here at Bigger Pockets. This show has two main themes: it's about multifamily, and it's about mentors. You know, a lot of people in real estate want to invest in multifamily for the the long term cash flow, the ability to add value, be a passive investor. But along the way, every single successful investor has had great mentors along the way. And many are great mentors now to other people. This show is all about extracting that knowledge from expert operators and people in the apartment space so we can learn about some of their great mentors and we can get advice from them to help you with your journey as well. So my name is Chris Lopez. My co-host is Terrence Doyle. Terrence, how are you, man? Dude, fantastic. We got sun out today in Denver. It's not quite as warm as Austin, Texas, but it is. it feels good <laughs> to me. And uh, man, you did a really good job with that intro. Thank you. I, 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 I practice about mentorship and multifamily. Yeah, that's the practice is paying off. That was really well done. Our guest today, I'm super excited to have him, David Tupin from Austin, Texas, originally from Michigan. And David is a budding entrepreneur that's done, I think, over a thousand multifamily units. Started buying when he was 19. You know, one of the things that I've really drawn to is just the younger generation that is hustling. They're making things happen. You definitely fit that box. It's been super enjoyable getting to know you the last couple hours and uh, i can't wait for everyone to hear your story so welcome to the show dude thanks for having me guys this is gonna be a blast yeah. excited so the number one question that we had come in was you know people know that you started buying when you were in college mm -hmm. i think you were 19 you talk about yep. you being a freshman you're going to class you're working you're underwriting i mean you, it was pretty impressive so what was that like trying to buy multifamily properties while you're in college, have no money, and you had no experience. What what was that like? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, the toughest part was at first getting that base level of knowledge. So when I talked to people, they took me seriously. And so I also at that time, I don't do it anymore. I used to wear a suit every day because wow. I thought it I, it you made me, that, right? yeah, yeah, totally made me feel like. Was that more was, for other people or for like your own like mental, like it makes you feel better? I think it was both. I think it was like, I, I knew I needed to just have insane confidence to be able to go and talk to brokers who are dealing mostly with very successful, uh, sophisticated investors. And here I am with a base level of knowledge. I'd been practicing underwriting deals and trying to get good at that and and you know coming in you have to know like the basic terminology so you at least sound like you know what you're doing um and a little bit of fake it till you make it you know i, I would come into the conversations talking to brokers and i was like oh i've got the funding lined up i've got financing lined up like i'm just looking for the right deal you know something under 50 units that has some value add and you know i got the lingo down and so um when i talked to them they're like oh, okay at least he sounds like he knows what he's doing i'm sure most of them are still pretty skeptical uh but um it was definitely a hurdle yeah. dealing with the age thing. So one of the things that I heard you say, you know, early on was that you spent the time to like get the knowledge base. Mm -hmm. And they say that like it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at something. Yeah. Like how many hours do you think? Because I think that's the key. Like people can see, you know, you're flying around on a plane. You've done all these deals. You know, you're, it looks like amazing, super yeah. like glamorous. Yeah. But what was that like? You know, what, you know, when no one's watching and it's like just you and LoopNet and an Excel spreadsheet, like how many hours actually went into getting your knowledge base down? I probably spent hundreds of hours just like practicing before I bought my first deal, like looking at properties, like I said, on LoopNet or from right. brokers, making offers. Before I bought my first pro property, I was under contract on another one that fell through. Uh, so I kind of had a little bit of experience mm -hmm. doing like some due diligence and stuff didn't work out like we found out there's a bunch of work they didn't tell us about that the roofs were like falling in and they didn't right. tell us so pulled out of that one pretty close after that one under contract on the next couple of deals um but dude it's 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 a grind like yeah. any business you're gonna do a lot of work that nobody sees and uh and and you have to be there and willing to be a little bit lonely and put in that time and effort to be able to come out on the other side and actually like get into your first project first yeah, deal. So I think that's so, huge. Hundreds of hours. I think hundreds, that's the punchline. Yeah. Hundreds and hundreds of hours before he did his first deal. Yeah. And that's a common theme for, I mean, successful entrepreneurs, investors whatsoever. Right. Sorry to interrupt you guys, but I, we got some questions coming in from here. So what we're going to do here, we're going to do some Q and A. We're going to do some rapid fire with David. So we'll, we'll do that. And we're going to interview an awesome interview with him. That's not live. That'll be published 
probably about two months or so from now. Yeah, end of April, right? Well, that's when the, the show launches, and then we don't have all the exact show dates out, but you'll be, yeah, April, end of oh, April and May will be nice. the full interview. So a little, a few nuggets for the audience to understand what I think David really specializes in is any questions surrounding deal structure, underwriting deals, or raising capital, I think that David is going to deliver a disproportionate amount of value. So that those topics, I mean, he can talk about anything, sure. um, but I do think that those would be the three topics to really focus on. So sourcing deals, how he's finding deals, how he's analyzing deals. He's even got a really cool model that he may be able to share with you guys and uh, and then raising capital. All right, shoot. So we got a few things here. Alexander says, is it worth putting solar panels into a multifamily roof? Yeah, I don't think now I've looked into it and I don't think nowadays the cost makes sense still unless you have in certain incentives. I know there's some tax incentives, mm -hmm. abatements and stuff like that. If you can get enough of those, it does make sense. I've heard of some programs where they'll actually like they'll actually take the cost of it and apply it to your property taxes over a certain amount of time. I mean, there's certain programs in general, most of my projects, no, it doesn't save you enough. And the reason being is because most properties Electricity is covered by the tenants. That's right. Right. It's not common. You don't have a ton of electric costs. So you're not saving a ton. You're passing the savings on and maybe you can charge higher rents, but tenants don't really look apples to apples at that. They're looking at the rent. They know they're going to have to pay their electric already. So, so I mean, the two main things for multifamily doesn't increase cash flow yeah. and doesn't increase NOI and solar panels is no and no. No, no. Yeah. Okay. No. I would say no. Not at this point, no. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Because the upfront expense is pretty large. Yeah. It's pretty large. Yeah. And, and the tenants pay electricity already. That's right. So you're I'm just saving tenants. them so you're, money. You're saving for common areas. Yeah. And the common areas aren't really big enough uh, to justify the expense, the mm -hmm. capital expense up front. No. Yeah. Totally All right. right. So we got some people from Austin. Michael Longoria. Hey. What's up? What's up Ethan, one of the shout outs. So Ethan, what's up, man? Everyone's got to Ethan. What's up, Ethan? How you doing, bro? Ethan, drop your questions in here, man. Um, so DM here. Uh, and so David Liss uh, lives North Austin. Yep. What are some areas in Texas that can find entry level multi units that cash flow? Not Austin. I would say anywhere but Austin. <laughs> anywhere outside of Austin. Dude, you're, oh my gosh, Austin is unbelievable. Yeah, it's four caps. You're talking right. Denver similar yeah. right now. I mean, you're buying stuff at four caps all day. Um, I would say go to tertiary markets surrounding more major cities. So I, I don't like to be in the middle of nowhere. I definitely don't like that. Like Angelo? Like Amarillo, or, yeah. or, you know, even like Midland, Odessa, they're yeah. big cities, but they're way west. Right. But but they're also like oil driven, so they're very volatile. Yeah. Um, I've had experience, and we can talk about it later. I've had experiences, and uh, it was actually a very good experience, but it almost was a very bad experience. I sold a property right before market crashed on um, the coast south of Houston in Texas. It was like an oil driven market, and uh, and I will never invest in a tertiary market like that again. That's that's driven by one uh, industry because I bought it at 90 something percent occupancy. Uh, I actually sold the property within six months. By the time we were under contract after we bought it, uh, three months after we bought it, we were under contract to sell it, closed six months after we bought it. Uh, we made a ton of money on it, but it was 75% occupied by the time we sold it. And that market now is at 50% occupancy. Um, mm. How did you sell it at a big profit when it had 70, 25%? vacancy dude we got so lucky so we had a guy knock on our door and he buys uh tax credit deals and he had access to some grant money for after hurricane harvey oh. and ours was in a very specific location where he could use this grant money. he had like free money essentially oh. and so he knocks on our door he said i want to buy uh this is 156 unit deal. he's like yeah, i want to buy this sienna villas from you guys and i'm like we just bought it it's not really for sale we're doing renovations and he's like no i'm gonna buy this deal from you like name your price like who name your price? Right, I've yeah. never gotten that before. Those are like the magic <laughs> words. Yeah, name your price. Yeah. I was like, oh my god, you bought it for eight point two million, uh, and six months later we sold it for eleven point two million. We didn't have to spend any of our renovation budget. Oh, More, maybe two hundred thousand. So yeah. uh, our investors did well. You know, we made um, almost a million bucks on that uh, deal in six months. And uh, by the time we sold it, it was down to seventy five percent occupancy. And six months later, that market was at fifty percent. We would have been underwater. And he didn't terminate. He stayed in the deal. Because oh yeah, because he had free money. Because the capital made sense for him. Oh yeah, he had, he didn't have to put any money, yeah. and it was government money. So for him, he's like, I'll hold it ten years, and I'll sell it again, maybe when the market's better in the future. Because wow. that those markets, they'll hire five thousand people, and then the prices go down, and then they'll fire seven thousand people. So you wouldn't have sold had he not knocked on your door. No, I would. You would have. You would still be holding. I'd that. be screwed. Yeah. 
And so I, that was a learning lesson for me. Wow. We did very well, but I will never buy in that kind of market wow. again. So mate, so back to the question. So yeah, so give us some, give us some specifics, some tertiary sub markets outside yeah. medium market. And he said in Texas, I mean, so go to Houston and, and maybe not downtown Houston, but maybe like Sugarland or North or, you know, the Woodlands or like in, in surrounding suburbs um, where you can get into some kind of C-class suburban or, you know, maybe go an hour out, go to like Katy or you can go to College Station or um, Waco, Temple. I mean, those are cities that are tertiary. They're not as hot as Dallas's and Austin's, but um, they're still good cash flow markets. I love tertiary markets. Yeah. I think that's wrong. There's money. There's, yeah. yeah. So, it's not sexy. There's not a lot of institutions chasing mm -hmm. those smaller markets. Mm -hmm. This is an underwriting question, but DT says, where is it best to invest $10,000? And so the reason I ask you this is because I mean you're you're 25 now, right? Yeah. You start investing when you were 19. Yeah. So I mean you you still have very fresh memories of being you know inexperienced. Yeah. Probably have a hard time rubbing you know two nickels together for earnest money. Sure. How do you make this stuff happen? If you got ten thousand dollars, what does someone do with ten thousand dollars? If you want to buy apartments or just get in or general, just general. Advice, give it for yeah. you know, investing. But a lot of times also get, take a step back. Sure. And give that bigger picture. If you got ten thousand yeah. dollars now, 100%. what should you be doing with it? Yeah, ten thousand dollars is not going to get you much of anything, right? So, and and that's the truth. I started investing. I had probably four or five grand banked. I didn't have any money. I moved home with my parents, and I used that money to live off of and pay for my expenses, my car, insurance, whatever, uh, while I was hunting for deals. And I knew that you know, even, even if I had ten thousand or twenty thousand dollars, I couldn't I couldn't buy a property with that. It's not enough. And it wasn't even enough for the earnest money. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you have 10 grand, I mean, maybe use it for, if you can get a deal locked up and maybe you get by an eight unit or 10 unit, maybe you can get $10,000 earnest money. Um, you know, you can negotiate that with the seller and that can help you lock up that first deal while you go raise capital or maybe it's seller finance and you can, I mean, there are creative ways you could use $10,000, mm -hmm. but in most scenarios, maybe send some mailers out, send some mailers out marketing. Yeah. Honestly, the best way is invest in yourself educate yourself. Yeah. Like if there's a way where you can join a group or I, after I bought my first two properties, I still really didn't have any money. I joined a mastermind on a credit card. I couldn't even afford it still. Um, a $20,000 mastermind, but it got me around people that I've now made multiple seven, seven figures partnering with. And so, so you paid 20 grand to join a mastermind. I had, and I couldn't afford it. Wow. Yeah. Whose master was it? Rod, like Rod Cleef. Oh, Rod Cleef's mastermind. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. And uh, that's where I met uh, one of my business partners, Glenn, who's also really? a great mentor of mine. And we bought five, 600 apartments together. Wow. That so Houston deal we did together. For you. Super, oh, oh my God. Yeah, unbelievably valuable. Yeah, Rod's going to be here next week, I think. It's a, a oh, week, from, Rod? Yeah. Uh, a week, week from right now. We're doing yeah. another live. Oh, Rod's a great friend. Yeah, yeah he's coming to uh, Costa Rica uh, with us in next oh, month. Oh, to your mastermind? mastermind. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, you guys you're, meet you're, in Costa Rica. We do all over. We've yeah. done a Aruba. Is he going to whitewater rafting with you? That's, yeah, he will. Oh, yeah, all we're right. Going to do it. Yeah. So talk about this, too, because $10,000, because you, you touched on a really good point here. Like, hey, you, you, know, you lived at home to reduce your expenses. Yeah. You had money. Talk about, hey, you got $10,000 to invest, but what did you plan from like a financial runway standpoint? Because I mean, ten thousand dollars doesn't go very long, but if you can't pay your bills in months three, yeah, your investing career is already over. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you balance? How much money do I need to like scale up versus how much do I start investing? I mean, I you know, I know it's tough to do it, but the biggest thing at first is like, don't get fancy. You know, live like well below your means. I'd say is my best. If we're just talking general financial, yeah, yeah, and you're right. you know we we're yeah. talking earlier, you love the you yeah. didn't know financial when literacy. Yeah, financial 100%. literacy is, is extremely important. Yeah. And even today, I live a year or two behind where I know I could spend. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, and so, um, I, I, ten. I mean, ten thousand dollars doesn't doesn't get you a lot in terms of investing. You can invest in yourself. You could use it to live off of while you go out and maybe build sweat equity. Uh, because in this business, really, it, it all comes down to finding a deal. There's nothing more important in real estate. I don't care what anyone says. There's nothing more important than finding a good deal because that's how you make money, mm -hmm. right? And and you have to have some knowledge to do that, which is also important. But until you find, so spend that time and go find a good property to buy. I love that. Educate yourself, invest in yourself. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. Huge. So along this line, this question has popped up from uh, Elvia Morales. What would you do with a hundred thousand oh, dollars to invest? We're, 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 gonna, we're gonna play this game now. Zero. All right, all right, I like that. A um, hundred thousand. So uh, a couple things you can do. You can definitely go and buy. I, I would say at that point, like if you want to buy something multifamily, do it on your own. You could absolutely house hack with something like that, right? You can go out and find a fourplex and use that as a down payment. House hack a deal, live it, live in it for a year, 
uh, and then move out. And now you've got a fourplex where maybe you, I mean, if you're buying it in Denver, you might've had to put the whole hundred yeah. down or maybe 50. Um, you could passively invest in a deal. There are a lot of people that syndicate, you know, I've syndicated projects and um, most of our investors invest 50 to 150,000. And, you know, they'll put in 50,000 into a project. Mm -hmm. They'll kind of learn the process, see how it goes, and then they'll start doing their own deals. Um, again, I invest in yourself. Right. Uh, but if, you know, if you could find partners and keep, I, I'm a big fan of liquidity. You hear Grant Cardone, I think it's stupid advice. Don't keep cash. It's invest all. I, I think you should always have some cash. Mm -hmm. You should always be a little bit liquid. Um, Do you like a rule of thumb, like three months, six months, 12 months, or like a certain amount, or just, just depends on everything? I, Yeah, I mean, it's constantly a moving target. But I'm, I always got like at least a year. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But that's I also one don't of those things that's like a personal thing. It almost, yeah. it almost maybe tied to like how people were raised, you know? Sure. Um, but I do agree, you know, cash is earning no entry. You know, it's one of the, it's a catch 22 because you definitely need to have, because there is something to be said for like your mental desk just feels lighter and you know, you have yeah. like all your expenses covered in yeah. the bank, mm -hmm. but at the same time when your money's in the bank, it's not earning any income. It's not, you know, it's like negative almost right now, Correct. maybe, you know, sure. uh, potentially. So, but, but it's like opportunity nice cost too. Yeah. So if I had a million dollars in the bank right now, um, I would rather wait two years to find a really, really good opportunity where I could maybe three X that money in a, in another two year period than to put it into something now where it would take five years to two X. Right. right. And so it's like opportunity cost. So right. just, I guess just being patient mm -hmm. for the right opportunity. Yeah. And opportunistic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For sure. All right. So I got one more question along this, uh, the ladder of money to invest questions here. Brian Walters says, I'm selling my business in May. Congratulations. Brian. And want to begin investing in multifamily. I should have about $800,000 to start with. Where should I start? I like that. Um, well, shoot me an email. Let's talk. Uh, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we should, uh, I would say, I I'm a big advocate of buying your own properties. And right. you start off doing that. And I think syndicating is awesome. I've syndicated a lot of deals. Um, what's it, Brian Walters. Uh, if you can take at least six months to a year, Brian, and just educate yourself and don't do anything with it, um, just sit on it for a while and figure out what type of asset you want to invest in, I think you'll be a lot better off. It goes back to what I said. You could put that $800,000, you know, into a property and maybe you didn't do a ton of research and you don't, maybe it takes you five, six years to double that money and you're making six, 7% cash flow. Or you can take a year, wait, hunt really hard, find something where you buy a deal day one where your money's worth double what you, what you have. So um, I would say you, dude, you've got to spend some time really learning the number side of multifamily. How do you get into a good deal at the right price? What what makes sense and how do you figure out how to offer that price, you know, and it comes down to the numbers. Totally. I mean, that's super well said. You know, the name of the show is the tribe of multifamily mentors, mentorship, you know. Uh, Brian, it sounds like you know how to build things, scale things, and then obviously execute and sell. Uh, I think that finding a really good mentor, you can job shadow, learn as much yeah. as you can, take a ton of notes, listen to a lot of podcasts, and Bigger Pockets has some great content out there uh there's just a ton of youtube podcasts yeah. a lot of ways to uh take in knowledge but i think getting a mentor in your market you know they're going to take you seriously when you tell them your story and they see that you have capital and maybe that's your first partner or you can go to i know you went to some meetups or some rias sure uh some uh some real estate groups in town find some guys that are you have things in common with that you trust that you enjoy being around and uh i think that you know my experience was even deals that I broke even on, I learned so much and valuable that even if you like went out and bought a duplex or a fourplex, yeah, I think most people need to understand that buying and owning real estate is sexy, but the management that goes along with it is not sexy, not sexy. and it's super hard. And so, and me saying that actually doesn't mean anything to you. You have to actually do it to yeah. understand what, you know, to really live in and experience it. So I think even a duplex, fourplex, start plex, with something and don't spend our whole 800 K, maybe yeah. spend a hundred and 50 something. or a hundred. Yeah. And yeah. Then see what it's like to like lease a, lease a unit or show a unit, market a unit, take pictures, clean it, renovate it, love it to collect rent, to do an eviction, you know, and then get to understand different parts of town. I think putting a few chips into a property and having mentors and digesting really good content, you end up in a really good place, but your first couple of deals, you may just break even, but what you learn at least that was my experience, will be invaluable. Yeah, 100%, dude. 
and think of it as a really long term. Like if you if you truly, I hear people all the time. I want to invest in apartments. I want to do multi. Like if your if your outlook on that is like over the next just twelve to twenty four months, you're doing it wrong. It's a five, ten, fifteen, twenty twenty year plan, right? To really build wealth and cash flow. Right. Um, and so, yeah, dude, get, get into something small, learn it. Like he said, I, that's great advice. Love it. So before I ask this next question, David, it set us up for the audience. The last three deals you analyzed, just the last three analyzed, what was the deal size on those? Like unit count or, or, or purchase oh price? Can you remember? It's got it, it, probably, they're probably all north of a hundred units. Okay. Yeah. hundred and hundred fifty. And all in Texas or different markets? <clears throat> all over. I mean, we look at a lot. I can't even, honestly, I could get, so I get deal are, merged. What all states are you looking deals. at? Uh, Texas, major markets, um, Indianapolis, mm -hmm. Michigan. Um, I own one property in Atlanta. I'd buy there still. And then uh, East Florida right now. I'm looking at some stuff. Wow. So Leslie Parker says, what are some no-goes when it comes to underwrite, underwriting? Or what do you wish that more people knew when it comes to underwriting? Property taxes. I see a lot of people get in this business and don't understand what happens when you buy a property and when a trade and gets reassessed. Um, I got screwed. I know we're going to talk on the podcast mm -hmm. that 96 unit deal. I, I budgeted just like a 10 to 15% increase. And I was like, oh, I should be covered. Um, my taxes went from 90,000 to 140,000 in that first year. And I was wow. like, dude, I didn't budget for that. I had no clue. And and it was just me running and gunning <laughs> in the deals and like not knowing, you know, I was, I didn't have a coach or whatever to t tell me that. And um, I figured that out the hard way. Um, another one would be closing costs. I mean, if you're under, it, this more it affects it more on smaller deals, but some lenders will require you to escrow a year of property taxes and insurance up front. So you want to budget. That's why I didn't get my fee on that first deal. I had to put it back in. Um, and be really careful on your renovation costs. My philosophy on buying properties, anything that I plan to hold for longer than three, four years, I do all, I, re, I renovate all the major items up front that need to be done. So if I have a roof that's got five years left on it, three, five years left on it, I'll do it. Because if I ever get in a situation where I'm stuck with a property and I raised capital from investors and I didn't budget to renovate the parking lot, which had, you know, two years left on it or whatever. And now, now I've got to come up with hundred thousand dollars to do it. I do that stuff up front, and then I have a clean, mm -hmm. well maintained property, lower maintenance costs while I'm holding it, and less stress. And yeah, there's no better way to ruin relationships with your investors than year three to do a capital call for something you didn't uh, that you didn't allocate Dude. for. I mean, yeah. Thankfully, I haven't been in that spot, but I know people that have, and I see it, and it's just like it's that's not good. painful. It's not good. That's painful. Yeah, yeah. you lose a ton of confidence. So yep. I yeah, I love that. Yep. You got to budget, you budget gotta, your renovations budget. up front. That's right. Yeah. Do it up front. Yeah, that's great. So Ostra Harris asks, how do you structure paying back investors that helped you close on a property? Yeah, good question. Um, there's a million different ways to do it. Uh, so I can give a couple examples. Most of the deals I've done, we have a, some sort of a straight equity split with investors. Maybe it's like a 70-30 split where the investors put up the money. I'll put a little bit of money in with that. Uh, they get 70% and then 30% is my sweat equity uh, for me or me and my partners on the deal. Um, our goal would be after two, three, four, five years, we'll sell the property whenever it's opportune. Uh, we'll sell the property, get them back their money. They get 70% of the profits. That's where I get my big chunk of the equity, the 30% right there. Do you guys do a pref? Uh, sometimes. I've done- You've done deals, no pref? Yeah, I've done several deals, no pref. Yeah. And and I do that because- the LP split? Uh, I've done 70, I've done all the way up to 50, 50 with no prep. Wow. Yeah. I have to, I need to learn more about that. Yeah. It's just, it depends on how good the deal Coming is. Coming in the interview. The better the deal, the more aggressive you can get on a split. Right. So I had a deal where 50%, a 50, 50 split got the investors a 10% return. I didn't have to give them 80% to get, and I know they were good with the 10%. They would love that return. And I, I only had to give them 50% to get them 10% return. So your investor, so your investor profile you kind of know that if you hit what is that ten? Normally, 14? it's eight eight percent uh, annual, eight percent cash yeah. flow, and then a fifteen percent like average annual right. IRR. Okay, yeah. IRR, yeah. yeah, yeah. So fifteen is really your target. Fifteen. So, IRR. so you know, if you see something that says twenty five, you're like, I can, I can get more aggressive. You get more aggressive. Yeah. And have you had any pushback on that? Sometimes. How do you handle? Yeah. Sometimes. How do you handle someone that, you know, Roger, from Austin, got a bunch of money. You want him in your deal, and he says. 
no, I need a, I, you know, I'm not going to pay you that, you know, I need, I want to prep or I want, I need a 17% return or when they push back yeah. on us for 50, 50, what, how have you been able to like smooth that out and handle that conversation? Cause it kind of applies to anything, you know, you're yeah. talking to a lender, a bank. Well, I think it's different now than it was three or four years ago for me. So I ran into this very issue on my first big deal where I think I did like, uh, I mean, it's just so, it's such a lack of knowledge for me. I think what I did was I, I had a structure where it was like a eight pref, 50, 50 split, but like their pref paid down their cap. It was like a really bad structure. Oh. And I could just, cause you know, lack of experience. <laughs> right. And I was like, oh, they're going to love this. <laughs> Nobody liked it. Right. So I had to change the structure completely. <laughs> and that's part of the reason why I couldn't raise the money on that deal in, in time. And I had to extend it. Um, and then I went to an eight pref, 70, 30. And then people were like, okay, they're all about it, it at that sense, point. Yeah. Um, so I have run into pushback. Nowadays, I kind of know the sweet spots and I know my investors. So when I run into people that are like, I don't like that structure, I just, I'm like, that's awesome. I'll take note of that and I'll let you know if I have something that matches. But like the structure is the structure. You know, right. I know I can raise so the at this capital. point, you're not negotiating. No, we don't you're negotiate. You're just saying thank you for your feedback. Get yeah. Noted. I know the way I look at deals. I'm really conservative. So yeah. I'm telling investors like 15 to 17 IRR. I've exceeded, I've exceeded the returns on every deal I've put together to date. Wow. Every time. Never lost investors' money. I've never even I've not go, gone below the expectations we've set, right. and so um, that's just how I look at deals. Yeah. And so I know with the structure I put it together at, we're gonna. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So I think the key there, you know, for everyone listening is, you know, you have to have some experience that breeds confidence. So then when you're talking to a bank, you're talking yeah. to an investor, you're talking to a contractor, any you know property manager, when you have executed and you have the experience. It gives you that confidence to be able to state and really mm -hmm. dictate terms. Yeah. But in the beginning, you got, I mean, give up as much of the deal get. as you yeah. can take what right. you can get. Yeah. I did a eight prof and 80 20. That was the first two deals I did. And that's give, giving up a lot of the deal, but it got me in the game. Right. The other thing I'll add on the there from a, di a very different metaphor and perspective, I go back to dating. You want to have more people in the pool, more fish in the pool. Yeah, that way, if someone go. says no, or like, hey, yep. here are my terms, like, hey, yeah. You know what? I, I don't need that. Yeah. I'm gonna go talk to Terrence here. Exactly. Oh, I don't need that. I'm gonna go talk to Dana. Yeah. I'm gonna go talk to Jules. Exactly. And then because you have the options. You have yeah, yeah, the you options. have the like I know a, I'm gonna playing fill field. It. Yeah. Exactly. Um, all right. So we got time for, for one more question. Um, before we take that, I wanna make sure we talk about this on the the live, David, because this is a you know, we had a really interesting last couple hours, really kind of talking details about yeah. your background, your business model. And you're working on some really cool software. Oh yeah, nice. Um, I mean, you're underwriting. You, you know, you told us how you spent, you know, years, you know, in the evening and the early mornings sure. working on a spreadsheet and building it right. Um, and then you're eventually able to sell that spreadsheet. You know, you know, thousands of copies on your website. But that plants the seed to go out there and start building some really cool uh, real estate software under Real yep. Estate Labs. Give us the high level about what that is, because at first, all right, cool, whatever. Another underwriting software. Sure. Then he explained to me, I was like. Oh, this is different. Yeah. Yeah. This it could is be big. Could be it's big. big. It's yeah. really big. So, you know, it's, it all started back in college. I did a, an internship. I was doing some investment banking. And one of the partners, this is when I first started listening to Bigger Pockets and wanted to get into multifamily. I was looking at deals on LoopNet. I built my own little spreadsheet. And uh, um, I talked to one of the partners at the firm. He kind of shared some knowledge and it just kind of evolved and evolved and evolved over, over time. I built out this pretty robust financial model. Um, that we use in our acquisitions and that a lot of people have bought and now use. And uh, I never really intended to sell it, but people were like, I like your model. Can I buy it from you? And I'm like, okay. And then I throw up it on my website and a lot of people ended up uh, just buying it word of mouth and, and use it now. And so uh, about two years ago, I hired a software company. I'm like, I need to bring this into a, like a web-based. I can do so much more with web-based than just with Excel. And there's a lot of more features, right, um, that we could provide. And so... Uh, I hired a company, spent like $60,000, which three years ago, I mean, it was like most of the money I had. I, like I was going all in on this, right? Wow. And um, so you've been working on this for three years. Yeah, that's where it's like that. originally wow. started. Cool. And they spent like six months and I got a terrible product. It didn't work. It looked terrible. Like I figured out now, I know nothing about software. Like <laughs> this is like totally new to me. I know apartments, I do not know right. software. And so I went back to the drawing board, waited kind of another year. I was busy with doing a lot of projects and real estate deals. Um, and I was like, I need to go back to the drawing board. I'm, I, this is going to be a lot more than $60,000 to get what I want. And I'm going to have to go hire the right company. So I found a good company out of San Diego. Um, hired so the $60,000 was gone? Oh, that was gone. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, wow. Nothing. It was, it was gone. So you hired a new company? Hired a new company. 
Now I'm spending half a million dollars on no the way. first version. Yeah. You're spending half a million dollars half on million this? Dollars in the first version. Oh, dude, wow. software is really going cheap, all in. Man. Yeah, no, it's going to be a really, uh, you know, and it's still not, it's still going to be, it'll be. Are you raising money or self-funded? Uh, half and half. Wow. Yeah. Aggressive. I like half it. And half. Um, and so just friends and family, you know. Okay. Um, but. Uh, half a million at software still, that's a big play. It is a big, yeah, for I a realize. start, for an MVP. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, and so it's an acquisitions platform. It's it's for anyone who's buy wants to buy apartments or is buying apartments um, from private equity to syndicators to a newbie starting out. Right? It's going to help you manage the deals you're looking at, analyze them and underwrite them, uh, provide data to help you with. You know, a lot of people starting out don't know what operating expenses do I budget, right? right? And so we're going to provide data around that. Um, and then uh, uh, it's going to read and parse T12s and nano and uh, rent rolls. So you can upload a rent roll. It'll read it, plot the unit mix, plot the average rents. Um, yeah, so doing a lot of the work. That's what I like. Do a lot of the legwork. Do a lot of the legwork, yeah. for, especially for newer yeah. newer investors or experienced ones that have a lot of volume and right. they need something to a lot expedite of the process. It could take us, yeah. you know, an hour to two hours uh, to do an underwriting, and then from there, obviously, it always it spends a lot more. We always spend a lot more time if we actually get into it and are getting an uh, offer accepted and stuff. We spend hours and hours underwriting. So. The goal is to have people be able to underwrite a deal start to finish accurately in like 15 to 30 minutes. Yeah. Very Huge quick. value. Yeah. That's going to be awesome. You can, you can create a letter of intent on there, custom. You just put in the price, your terms. It'll create it, send it out for you, DocuSign, all that stuff. Um, you'll be able to generate reports about the properties you're underwriting so you can share with investors. We spend hours doing that normally. Uh, and then eventually, you know, the goal is you can get your projects financed and funded through the platform as well. And this launches quarter two this year, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mid 2020. Okay. Yeah, summer or sorry, 2021 or 2021. Yeah. How, so how much time a week are you spending on this platform? Uh, like using it? No, just trying we, to build it up. Cause doesn't it, don't they need your input? They're going to like, correct. Yeah, I'm working a lot yeah. with the software company. Yeah. I spend probably 30, 40 hours on the software company now and then 40 hours on the real estate company so at like the moment. Part time. That's like half, half of half your bandwidth time. is going to this correct. project. And it'll oh, cool. shift more over the next year yeah. to where I'm most of my time is in that. And then, you know, I'm buying more real estate assets, uh, yeah. you know, on my own or JV type deals, stuff like that. Yeah. So. All right. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Uh, this is the last question I want to get to, and then we'll wrap up here and go do the, uh, the full interview with you. Sweet. And, oh, I just, all these questions. Sorry guys. we got so many questions coming in. We cannot get to them all. One question when I look for this, David, we have a few people ask about learning where they can invest from you. Give people just like the, your website for obsidian capital. Sure. Like where can people learn more about, about specific deals you're doing yep. just, you know, all that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. It's obsidiancapitalco.com. Uh, and you can look on there. There's some details about uh, how we work. We have an uh, online platform. Investors can register, see the deals that we uh, push out for investment. And, um, you know, we normally do two to five deals a year that are open for investment. So you can find it all out there. All right. So this is a question really, I mean, Terrence, so you and I talk about this a lot, just in our, our general masterminds and hanging out. Mm. And you you threw twenty thousand dollars on on a credit card yeah. to a mastermind, which can go it can go one or two ways. It's it's, one there's or two there's, ways. there's, yeah, there's yeah, yeah, very sure, little sure, middle sure. in that spectrum there. But Pramod asked, is it worth investing thirty thousand dollars to get a multifamily mentor to use his ecosystem and his community? Um, absolutely not, one hundred percent. Real estate lab. If it's okay if I plug this <laughs> real estate lab, I have a multifamily community with about 150 members. It's all apartment investors from beginners to people that own thousand plus apartments. It's $3,000 for an entire year, not $30,000. And we do multiple Zoom calls a week where I'm teaching people how to invest in apartments. We have a big Discord group chat. Uh, we have, I have a whole video course, tools, documents that help people get in. It's like basically helping anyone get started. And then also... I think since November of 2020, when we launched it, it's been what, it was six months now. We've had people close on over 400 apartments in the group, and people are it. people are JVing it. in the yeah. group. Like I love, I'm providing real value. True, value. you're teaching a class there every single week, dude. I do two. Group. I do one or two Zoom calls every single week. I'm on there for like two hours, um, just I, working with, literally just talking colleagues. to the group. Wow. Like this is how well one one uh, call it'll be like I'll talk for financing on two hours and then I'll actually pull up deals I've done and say like this is the loan that I've got here's the actual term sheet from a lender like I'll show them my purchase agreements I'll show them my partnership contracts like I I dive 
so much more to my business than I can do publicly on YouTube because it's a private group. And it's that's amazing. So much cheaper. Than so you're that. delivering a lot of value. It, I mean, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. So definitely put that on the radar to check out because I mean, there, the you know having the mentorship and community yeah. Yeah, is is that. highly worth it. But you gotta make sure you're spending your money yeah. and your time in the yeah. in the right one. Yeah. The fact that you're building that ecosystem of mentorship and kind of collaboration, and you're sharing like super transparent information. Yeah, and that's amazing. I opened my entire yeah. business. Like I just show you guys everything. So have you got have you done deals with anybody in that group? Uh, I have not yet, but I get sent a lot of deals and I know a lot of the guys in that group, like, like a couple weeks in, one of the guys came to me, he's like, Oh, I met somebody through the group and we just bought a six unit together wow. in Michigan. And so a lot of people in the group. Oh my gosh. Kind of yeah. Stuff. They're all, yeah. It's all networking community. We do the zoom has like these breakout room calls and yep. we'll do those like every other week we'll do break everybody out. You know, we have 150 people in the group, so we'll have a bunch of rooms of four or five and everyone's networking and. Um, we're doing our first live event in June, actually. So the whole group's coming down to Austin. We're going to do a live event. So that's amazing. Dude. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's right. really, really cool. Yeah. All right. Well, well, David, first off, thank you. You're but for everyone, the bigger pockets, the social channels out there, uh, thank you guys and girls for coming out. Uh, we're going to wrap up here and then we're going to sit down and do a more in depth interview with David, talk about some of his background, talk about his first property where he made some money put it back in the property yeah. and how he house hacked a 96 unit property, uh, which is pretty phenomenal. So that show should drop sometime in May because we get to officially launch the uh, tribe of multifamily mentors show in bigger pockets here the last week of April. So you can look out for more details and please guys make sure you, you like us on YouTube on Facebook, leave comments, give us that feedback. It helps us keep doing more and more shows. So David, Terrence, everyone, thank you guys. That was yeah. great. Thanks guys.